thank you for today. Father God, I thank you for the presence of your spirit. I thank you for your heart, dear Lord, and each person who's here. Father God, I just thank you for the hearts who, who have said, you know, God's important to me. I want to be there. I want to come together with my family this morning. God's number one, and they're here. And Father God, and their hearts are open. And Lord, I just ask that you, you would fill each and every heart here with exactly what it is that it needs exactly what it needs from this message, exactly what it needs that may not even be in this message, but it's in this building. It's in, in the presence of you, dear Lord. As we come together, it's, it's that is what is needed. Father God, I just, I just ask you to fill those hearts. Fill each and every one of ours, Lord, that, that we, would, we would have hearts for you. And, and Lord, to, today let us not walk away from here the same as when we came in. Let us walk away changed. Let us walk away challenged. Let us walk away. Let us walk away convicted, dear Lord. That that w- that your Spirit, when it convicts us today, we don't just say, "Ah, I'm going to reject it." Instead, when we get convicted today, we say, "Oh, I'm going to step into it." And so, Father God, I just ask for that that openness, that heart, that same heart. Those kids came out here with that enthusiasm, Lord. I ask you to come out with that, to help us come out with that enthusiasm also as we walk away. That we we walk away, and every day we have that enthusiasm, Lord. And so, Father God, I just I just thank you in advance for what you're going to do, Lord. Let this be your message, not mine. Let me purely be a conduit, dear Lord. Nothing more that I'm just a conduit, dear Lord, a servant of yours, doing what you asked me to do this morning. And Father God, we come to you also with the prayer that your son taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Well, what a beautiful God morning it is. I don't know what we did to to deserve this warm of a day today. And I'm pretty much thinking we didn't. Okay, so just so you (laughs) clarity on that. Uh, what a beautiful day. What a wonderful day to, uh, after a few chilly days, we got a little warm up. God said, okay, okay, fine, I'll let you thaw a little bit. And uh, uh, just, just so he could prepare us for what's really coming, right? And so um, this morning we're going to pick back up in, in Daniel 5. Uh, and as I said earlier, and I'll, I'll catch up to you there. Um, this morning in Daniel 5, we'll be introduced to a new king of Babylon. Um, Belshazzar uh, is, is the new king, um, the current king, uh, technically one of two, because his, his father is actually king, but he's away trying to re-secure trade routes that the Persians have, have wreaked havoc on for the Babylonians. So Belshazzar is the king serving, he, he's technically second in command in the country uh, of Babylon, but he's the king that we're talking about today. Um, his his father doesn't get a whole lot of of, of playtime uh, in scripture, but anyway, so he's the he's the king. Uh, remember Nebuchadnezzar, King Nebuchadnezzar. We've been talking about him and how Nebuchadnezzar was he was a pagan king, and then then he um, uh, he he he, fr- he claimed. Uh, he claimed Daniel's God, but he, he said it, you know, but he never really committed to Daniel's God. He never really uh, got, he never got rid of his pagan gods. Remember that? And then eventually uh, God, God uh, prevails in his life in, and uh, he does start following uh, uh, Daniel's God. He starts uh, um, worshiping Daniel's God at the end. Um, in, in Daniel uh, 4, verse 37, it says, Now I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise and exalt and glorify the king of heaven. That's, I think he came over to the, to the, to the light side, right? Um, it, he says, uh, Because everything he does is right and all his ways are just, and those who walk in pride he is able to humble. And remember, Nebuchadnezzar got himself humbled, didn't he? Remember that um, he had he was removed from his throne. He was he was he was cast out from the people. He ended up going cuckoo for cocoa puffs for about seven years. He's he was eating the grass with the oxen, that sort of thing. Um, he went insane for seven years until he humbled himself, until he came to the Lord and, and gave his life over to Him. Um, when when he he allowed God to be God instead of Him having all of His little carvings be His gods, right? Remember that. Um, and thankfully, thankfully, he was he was. He was humbled, and thankfully you and I can be humbled. And some of you are like, I don't like being humbled. 
trust me, Nebuchadnezzar didn't like it either, right? And so, so he was humbled, and thankfully God wants to humble each and every one of us that we would come and be who he calls us to be instead of who we want to be, and that we would worship him as the one and only God instead of all these little gods that we have in our lives. And so today, though, we're, we're going we're gonna to move on from, from Nebuchadnezzar. I just, just a reminder of that in case you missed last week, the week before, whatever. Um, and it's just a reminder there as to who Nebuchadnezzar was, who Belshazzar's, who, who his ancestor is, because that's his grandfather. And so, um, it, but Belshazzar, guess what? You know, Nebuchadnezzar comes to the Lord. He, he's humbled and he, he devotes himself to God. And two generations later, we have King Belshazzar, and Belshazzar is as prideful as Nebuchadnezzar ever was. He has a major pride issue that that I and pride is very capitalized in his life, and uh, so so he has this problem also. And I don't know; it it seems like it's this Babylonian king thing must just be a pride thing, right? Or may, may, maybe it's more of a just a leadership thing is maybe a pride thing, right? Or or maybe it's just that human thing tends to lead to a pride thing. And we have that I problem until we give it up to our God problem, or uh, to, our, to our God solution, I mean, right? Um, so, so today we're going to look at Belshazzar, and we're going to look at, we're going to have, I have three questions for you today as we, as we look at that. And starting in Daniel 5, verse 1, King Belshazzar gave a great banquet for a thousand of his nobles and drank wine with them. While Belshazzar was drinking, uh, drinking his wine, he gave orders to to bring in the gold and silver goblets that Nebuchadnezzar, his father, or it says father, but the root word, the original language, that word would be grandfather or male relative. Okay, and and uh, even according to the historians, if you even if you were not a scripture believing person, if you don't believe in God, even the, the historians have said. Even they say Nebuchadnezzar is his grandfather, okay? So, but that's what that, that root word was, grandfather, male relative, um, so, or father, okay? And so anyway, his father had taken from the temple, the, the goblets his father had taken from the temple in Jerusalem so that the king and his nobles, his wives and his concubines might drink from them. So they brought in the gold, uh, gold goblets that had been taken from the temple of God in Jerusalem, and the king and his nobles, his wives and his concubines, drank from them. As they drank the wine, they praised the gods of gold sil and silver, of bronze, iron, wood, and stone. Will they never learn? Will they never learn, right? Now they're taking, they're taking these goblets that Solomon had made, uh, that God, God who, who guided Solomon? God, right? And he was guiding him as he built that temple, as he, as he, as he uh, furnished that temple. These goblets were made for the priests to be able to do, uh, to worship God in the temple, in the holy place. Um, and they, that's what they were meant for. These were strictly meant for worshiping our God, the Jewish, the, the Hebrew God at that time, the, the God of Daniel. And they're taking these goblets and using them to worship they're gods of gold, silver, wood, stone, bronze. They're using them to worship little G gods, the ones that they've carved. It just floors me. I'm like, man, will they never, ever learn? Do these guys, th th those, those people, they, they, those people need to, they need to, they need to connect some dots. And then I think, those people need to connect some dots. Those people need to connect some dots. Those people need to connect some dots. And if I just pointed at you, you're not the only one. Okay? And remember I did this one, right? Will we never learn? Because we continue to put our little G's in front of our God. Whether that's the job, whether it's money, whether it's football, whether it's that it's the season for that. Uh, maybe NASCAR, maybe, okay? I don't know. You know, I've, a funny thing, I've never heard a preacher go, you know, if you wouldn't worship NASCAR, because <laughs> I really don't think there's too many people who do. It just looks good on the screen, right? So, um, but uh, anyway, I, no, they do. My, my father-in-law used to, he, he didn't worship NASCAR, but he loved his NASCAR. So, um, but anyway, uh, uh, those, those little G gods that we have, sometimes those little G gods are the ones we birthed. We make them a god. Sometimes it's that one we married, we make them a god, right? Will we never learn? So 
so I'm curious today, as we talk about as 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 we talk about Belshazzar and 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 his his little gods, I'm curious today. Um, as, as, as they celebrated their feast, as they celebrated um, with God's goblets, they celebrated their little G's as they feasted. What is it that you are feasting on today? What are you feasting on? Are you feasting on God's word? Maybe you're feasting on written word, but maybe it's not necessarily God's word maybe the feast you decide to add in some other things and they've been doing it for d- generations and generations and generations right there's there's things out there that some people believe are scripture God did not ordain to have in here and yet they're studying them and giving them the credence of this they were written in the same era so it must be just as good they're giving credence to it. There, there, there's, there's, I personally have been uh, uh, a prophet s from the 1800s um, that I personally have had family members who followed her writings as much as they did this. There's people from the 1900s. People are following their writings as much as they do this given it as much credence, as much credibility as this. There's no way it got in here if God didn't want it in here, and there's no way it was left out of here if God wanted it in here. This is his word. Are we feasting on his word or the word of mankind? Are we feasting on his word or are we feasting on the word of the world? What are we feasting on? Are we being fed daily by our Bible? Are we being fed daily? Are we eating daily for, in time with God in prayer? Are we eating daily as we're praying with our Lord? Are we being filled up in fellowship with brothers and sisters following Christ? Where are we eating? What are we feasting on? How are we being filled? How are we being fed? Or are we feasting on our little G gods? Or are we feasting on physical pleasures, personal pleasures, whether in flesh or on screen? What are we feasting on? What are we feasting on? I pray it's time with God and in his word, with him in prayer, with with brothers and sisters, fellow followers of Jesus Christ, not just and it's not, I'm not saying don't be around people who don't, aren't following Jesus. I'm not saying that. But I'm saying I, I pray that you're feasting on that. That you're purposely making time to be in fellowship with others who are followers of Jesus Christ. And that they're a priority in your life. Versus the people of the world, so to speak. Matthew 4, verse 4. Jesus answered, it is written... Man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. Not on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. You know what came from the mouth of God? It's right here. We need to be feeding on that. 1 Corinthians 3, 2, I gave you milk, Paul says. He says, I gave you milk, not solid food, for you were not ready for it. Indeed, you still, you, you are still not ready little background on on first and second corinthians there actually should be at least second and fourth corinthians is what they really should be because first corinthians references a letter that he wrote previously to the church of corinth and so that means there was at least one before first corinthians and then in second corinthians it, it references a letter that was that he previously previously written and that is not first corinthians it's of a subject not included in first corinthians so he's he really wrote at least four letters to the church of Corinth trying to get them back on track, trying to help them stay on track, trying to help them to follow God, be the Christians they're supposed to be. Now, he also, he also planted the church of Corinth, correct, on his missions. He's, he founded this church, right? So he, he founds this church. He builds it, what God does through him, 
builds this church, right, and teaches and, and has, we're good to go. I can move on and go to another and start another church, right? And so he's had this influence on him once, and then he's written a letter that we don't know about, and then except for a snippet from 1 Corinthians, and then we have 1 Corinthians, right? And in here he says, he says, uh, I gave you milk, not solid food, for you were not ready for it yet. Indeed, you're still not ready. Three major influences of time that he's poured into them, and on this third one, they're still not ready for food. They're still only on milk. Hebrews 5, 12 through 14 says, In fact, though by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you the elementary truths of God's word all over again. You need milk, not solid food. It's saying, wait a minute. By this point, you should be teaching others, and at this point, you need someone to teach you because you don't even have the the basic elements of it. You're still on milk. You can't go to solid food yet. You can't chew yet. Why? They didn't have God's word. But they had they had the teachers of the word. And they could go to them. They were allowed to go in prayer. Right? Jesus, Jesus is like, hey, pray in my name. Right? You can talk to the Father. He's right here. Right? He wants you to be in fellowship with him. He wants you to talk with him, right? And they had fellow believers that they should have been, a, fellow followers, I should say, because remember, even the demons believed, um, fellow followers that they should have been in fellowship with and should have, but between those things, they should have been able to grow to the point where they were able to eat at least oatmeal for crying out loud. Let's make some porridge. But they were still stuck on milk. Anyone who lives on milk, being still an infant, is not acquainted with the teaching about righteousness. But solid foods is for the mature who, by constant use, have trained themselves to distinguish good from evil. We'll never get to the solid food, folks, if we don't ever get into the Word. We'll never get to the solid food if we're not one-on-one with God. We'll never get to the solid food if we're never in fellowship with with fellow followers of Jesus Christ. And it's not just one, but all three. Guess what? One could be milk. You add that second ingredient. What's that second ingredient? Now at least you got oatmeal, for crying out loud, or porridge or something, right? Let's add a little flour. Now we got some, we got some substance to it. Add some meat to it, whatever. And you can get a meal out of it. You can start actually growing and being nourished, truly nourished. But so often in our world, we believe that, well, I just all, I, I, I read that, that meme that was on Facebook. I'm done. I'm good. Right? I, I, I said, God bless you to, to my friend when they walked away, when we left. Right? When they walked away, they went the other direction. I said, God bless you. So I talked about God today. I'm good. When I smashed my finger, I said something to God. Right? But we call that being a Christian. But that's being an infant. That's breast milk or, or, or cow milk at best. Let's go back to our story, back to our, our scripture. Uh, Daniel 5, verse 5. Suddenly the fingers, this is, remember now, uh, uh, Belshaz- Belshazzar's having this party with his thousand friends. By the way, these are, these are like, it, 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 these are a thousand nobles, right? Remember the 5,000, we've talked about that, how the 5,000 really was at least four times that many because it's a male-dominant world, okay? So, so the reality is here, it, this 1,000 is really going to be the male nobles. Um, it, that's not counting their wives and their concubines and their whatever and whatever and whatever, okay? So really, you're going to have minimum of 4,000 people that he's partying and hanging out with, right? Remember that? Um, and, and they're such good friends, you know, it's kind of like Facebook. Oh, I got 1,000 friends on Facebook. So you know, like five, you know? Um, so, you know, see what I'm saying? So, so remember, this is where they're at. Now, he's put, he brought out the goblets. They're partying. They're worshiping their little man-made gods, Okay, with with the goblets meant to worship God alone. Verse 5, suddenly the fingers of a human hand appeared and wrote on the plaster of the wall near the lampstand in the royal palace. The king watched the hand as it wrote. His face turned pale and he was so frightened that his legs became weak and his knees were knocking. His knees were knocking, folks. He's freaked out. The blood's drained out of his face. He's seen this happening. Of course, if I, I got to be honest, um, if there's a hand starts writing on the wall over here, 
I might be like a little concerned myself, okay, right? And so, but the reality is what, right? You know, he's, he's freaked out. He's totally freaked out. Imagine, imagine being one of those, 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 those uh, um, party goers, one of his, his closest friends, of course, um, uh, and, and you have this, this king of yours who very boisterous, very arrogant, very cocky, very confident, all about himself and all about the party and all about his little G-gods and all this, and he's fully and completely, he thinks, in control, and suddenly he's white as a ghost and he's knocking at the knees, he's about to wet his pants. Imagine being there and going, oh my, what just happened? And also imagine this, now think about this. They're two generations away from Nebuchadnezzar, right? They're second generation below. So some of them may have actually been alive when Nebuchadnezzar was still king. So they got to see King Nebuchadnezzar go cuckoo for Cocoa Puffs for about seven years. And suddenly they have this extreme dramatic change, freak out mode from his grandson. Might make you question the the lineage of your royalty of your country, right? Just think about that. Let's put that in context a little bit. Might freak us out a little bit. We've never, we've never, no, nobody in here, I don't care what generation, right? And I'm not talking just current president. Uh, None of us have ever thought our president must be nuts, right? We've never thought, why would he think that? Why would he do that? We've never thought that about our senators. We've never thought that about our governors, We've never thought that about our parents, you know. But, but you know, but these people in, in these higher positions, we've never thought about that in our government, have we? Right? It, you, they had to be kind of going, what in the heck are we following? Who's leading us? He's all whacked out here. So anyway, uh, so what's, what's when Belshazzar, Belshazzar, he, 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 he turns pale, his blood drains, he starts his knees, it literally <laughs> Talks about his knees shaking and quaking, right? And he's watching his hand, and it's so so. There's this writing on the wall. He doesn't know what it is. So what's he do? Of course, he calls Daniel, right? Because that's what Nebuchadnezzar did. Of course, he must have called Daniel because he knows he's going to have the answers, right? No. No. Let's get the wise men in here again. Let's get my magic men in here. Let's get my 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 hocus pocus guys back in here again. Let's bring them in. And he doesn't call on Daniel, and he, he promises them, though. He brings in all of his wise men, and he promises them, hey, here's the thing. I'm going to give you a, 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 a purple robe, which purple is, is the color of royalty. Um, so, and it's not just a cloth or anything like that. I'm not giving you a hat, right? I'm not giving you a sash. He's going to give them the purple robe, which means a royal robe. Is what that's talking about is a royal robe that he's going to give them. He's going to give them a gold necklace for around their neck. It's not going to just be any old gold necklace. It's not like you went down to the nickel and dime store and got the cheap knockoff, right? This is, this is going to be one of the royal necklaces, and he offers them the third seat in royalty in Babylon. So, so his father's away. Um, and and uh, 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 Nabonidus, uh, um, is, is his father's name is Nabonidus, and he's away, right? But King Belshazzar is, is in charge here, so he's number two, right? And he's offering the third spot in, the, in control of their kingdom to whoever can tell him what the writing on the wall is. And his wise men come in, and they're like, dude, no clue. Man, I would really like that position, though, if it's still open. You know, I'll check it out. I'll take it, right? They have no idea what's on that wall, of course. But the queen hears. She hears this, this, this going on, and she comes in and helps him out. Before we get to that, though, I have a question for you. What's written on your walls? What's written on your walls? We've all got writing on our wall. Every one of us has writing on our walls. What's written on your walls? Belshazzar's trying to figure out what's on his. He's freaking out over it because he doesn't know what's written on his wall. Do you know what's written on your wall, right? What's written on your walls? 
do you need, is there something written on your walls and, and, and you're like, I, I, there's something there. I have no idea what it is. I need a Daniel to share with me what this is. Maybe there's something, maybe something you need help with. So what's written on your walls? Well, Shazer's freaking out. Face is pale. He's, he's beyond frightened. He's, 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 he's freaked. The queen mother hears it. She hears all the commotion. She comes on in and says, hold on, grandson. Because this is, this is actually Belshazzar, or, uh, 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 Nebuchadnezzar's wife, okay? Um, so it's, it's actually Nebuchadnezzar's wife. And she comes in and says, grandson, here's the thing. Okay, chill out. Grandpa had the same problem. Okay, he had not, not the right in the hand on the wall, but, but he had these dreams. And Daniel, he's 82-ish years old now, but Daniel, he, he's retired, but I'm pretty sure he'll come out of retirement and give you a hand. Have him come in and tell you what the writing on the wall is. She says he's got these gods, he's, he's got the spirit of these gods, okay, the little G again, and, and, and the S for multiples instead of the big G and there's only one, Right? But she says, but he's got the spirit of these gods, and he can tell you what's on that wall. She believed in Daniel. She just didn't believe in our God, okay? And so she says, she says call him in. So Belshazzar does, and, and he offers the same gifts to, to Daniel that he's offered to the other wise men. He offers up, get this, right? Daniel, remember, Daniel was a slave. He was... He was he was, he was part of Judah. They were conquered. They enslaved him, and he, came, he comes on staff for Nebuchadnezzar back in the day, right? And he's been on staff ever since he's been between 15 and 17 years old. Okay? And so, so Daniel's been around. He could end up running Babylon. Right? He's offered that opportunity. Now, there's, there's a temptation. And if you have a pride issue, there's a definite temptation. Right? And so anyway, so Daniel says, you keep your stuff. You give it to someone else. I don't care about that. But here's the thing. I'll still share with you. He says this. He says in verse 17, then Daniel answered the king, you may keep your gifts for yourself and give your rewards to someone else. Nevertheless, I will read the writing for the king and tell him what it means. So Daniel proceeds to tell, uh, to, to remind Belshazzar uh, of of. God, the, the, the story of God and, and King Nebuchadnezzar and what happened there and how Nebuchadnezzar was all kinds of full of himself. He had all these victories, but they were only by the hand of God. And when God got tired of him thumbing his nose at him, God, God uh, took his sanity away, took his throne away, and put him out with the, with the oxen to eat grass for seven years. And when Nebuchadnezzar finally humbled himself and, 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 and acknowledged God as the God that he is, when he finally did that, God restored everything to him. So he recounts this to, to Belshazzar. And in verse 22, he says, But you, Belshazzar, his son, which, again, that root word can me, means depend, uh, 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 descendant, uh, um, successor, Grandson, it does mean all these things, male lineage. Um, but you, Belshazzar, his son, have not humbled yourself, though you knew all this. It wasn't that he didn't know. Though you knew all this, Grandma didn't need to remind him because he already knew about King Nebuchadnezzar. He already knew what had happened with God with King Nebuchadnezzar. He already knew about the insanity, the loss of the reign, the loss of everything, and the reinstatement of everything. When King Nebuchadnezzar finally acknowledged that God is God and he started praising and worshiping him. He already knew all that. That's what he's saying right here. Even though you already knew all this. He says, Daniel tells him, he says, look, here's the thing. You defiled those goblets that were made for the priests, the goblets that were to only be used in the temple, the goblets that were only to be used to praise and worship our God, the God of Judah, the God of Israel, the God of Daniel. That's what they were made for. That's the only purpose they have. They were not to be used for anything else, and you used them to worship your little gods that you create. You've mocked God as much as he's going to take. You've mocked the God who could snuff you out at any time. You've mocked the God who can take away any authority, any power, any wisdom, any, any sanity that you have. He could take away the breath that you're breathing. He can take it away just like that. He's got it in the palm of his hand, just like he has ours in the palm of our hand. He's got it in the palm of his hand. 
and you were mocking him. And you think he should just keep on letting it go. He can wipe you out at any time he desires. And in verse 23, he says, but you did not honor the God who holds in your hand your life and all your ways. Your life and all your ways. Our life and all our ways. That God, that same God, that's what he's talking about. Maybe, maybe you know the writing that's on the wall. Maybe, maybe you know what that writing is. Maybe you understand it. So if we're honest with ourselves this morning, are you afraid of the writing on the walls? Are you afraid of the writing on the walls? Belshazzar was afraid. He was totally, completely freaked out, afraid. Are you afraid of the writing on the walls? And even more than that, if you're not afraid, should you be? Or is your pride just welling up so that it's like, no, I don't have to worry about it. It's no big deal. He doesn't really mean it. It's okay. It doesn't. I, I know what he's telling me to do. I know what's over here. But it's me. He's going to let it go. Because I'm me. And I'm amazing. And I'm all me. When in reality, you should be afraid of what's written on that wall. Verse 25, this is the inscription that was written, Mene, Mene, Tekel, Parson. Here is what these words mean. Mene, God has numbered the days of your reign and brought it to an end. Catch the language. He's numbered your days and brought it to an end. Not he's numbered your days and he knows when it's going to end or it's going to end or it might end and brought it to an end. Tekel. You have been weighed on the scales and found wanting. You've been weighed on the scales and found. That's how they valued things was they'd weigh them on the scales and depending on what they were weighing, that's what the value was. They went by weight on many, many, many things back then. Very, very agricultural and even, even, but, but even with minerals and anything else, um, it was, it, they weighed them on the scales. He says, you've been weighed on the scales and found wanting. In other words, righteousness should be here, and instead your unrighteousness is here. And as you know with a scale, one side goes down, the other goes up. And what he's saying is you're, la- you're found wanting, you're found lacking, you're really, you're, the, you're really out of whack on this. You're weighted in the wrong direction. Perez, your kingdom is divided and given to the Medes and Persians. Your kingdom, not your kingdom will be divided, not your kingdom might be divided. If you don't change your ways, your kingdom will be. It says your kingdom is divided, and then he tells him who he's given it to, the Persians and the Medes. That's the writing on the wall. God had brought his kingdom to him and God was taking his kingdom away from him. And the same can happen to us. I don't care what your kingdom is. God's given it to you. He can take it away. I'm not the castle, of, uh, I'm not the king of my castle. God is. And if he wants to take my castle away, he can. I don't care where my castle's at, what my castle is. And the same goes for each and every one of us. It wasn't a, if you don't straighten out, it was a, this has already happened. It's a done deal. I'm tired. I'm done putting up with you. I pray God's not done putting with, up with us. I pray that each and every one of us, hey, you know, I pray that our writing on our wall says, if you don't, I'm gonna. Or if you will, I will when he gives us those promises, right? That's, that's my prayer for us. This reminds me, it reminds me a lot of, of uh, another parable about a rich fool. Remember the rich fool, the rich man who had the ma- amazing, amazing harvest and all that, right? His barns weren't big enough. Jesus shares with us in Luke 12, verse eight, starting in verse 18, he says, then he said, this is what I'll do. I will tear down my barns and build bigger ones. And there I will store my surplus grain. Not, not the grain that I just got that I'm gonna need, my surplus, that's where he's going to store his surplus grain is in the bigger barns. 
And I'll say to myself, you have plenty of grain laid up for many years. Take life easy. Eat, drink, and be merry. Anyone ever heard that, eat, drink, and be merry? Did you know that was scriptural? Yep, most people don't. That comes from the Bible itself, and yet we use it to say, let's go get drunk and be foolish. Let me go gorge myself, get drunk, and just hang out. Just let's laugh. It doesn't matter what we laugh at. Let's laugh at God. It's okay. Right? I've been at those eat, drink, and be merry parties. Unfortunately, I led some of them. We weren't being merry about God's so good. Anyway, but God said to him, you fool, this very night your life will be demanded from you. Then who will get what you have prepared for yourself? This is how it will be with whoever stores up things for themselves but is not rich toward God. God's word is true, it's infallible, and it's never changing. This reminds me of that, that parable. And that parable reminds me of my life and of yours. Where, where are we storing our riches? Our scriptures tell us where our, where, where our, where our um, heart is at, or where our riches are at is where our heart is at. What we value, that's where our heart is at. Whatever is of most utmost importance to us, that's where our heart is at. Tonight could be the night that our accounts are called due. Are you prepared for that? Honestly, getting in your car, driving out on the highway, your accounts could be called due. Walking out the door, your accounts could be called due. You don't even have to get that far. Before the last song, your accounts can be called due. Are we ready for that? Are we prepared for that? Do we know what's written on our wall? Do we understand what's written on our wall? Do we need to find a Daniel to help us understand what's written on the wall, what God's put there? Are we afraid of what's on the wall? Are we willing to change what we're doing and uh, to, to, to come in agreement with what God's written on our wall? Are we prepared for that? Are we ready to do that? We all know. We all know exactly um, if we're following God, and we also know how we're following God. Because we can claim it doesn't mean we're really doing it. We can, we can pretend in front of people, certain people, of course, because the certain ones, they don't care, right? But when we're around those fellow followers of Jesus Christ, by golly, we've put on the show, make her look good, man. But we know, and even more importantly, God knows the truth of our heart. Where are we at? How are we doing with that? Are we following him or not? And how are we following him? Are we found lacking? Are the scales way out of balance for us too? Where are we with that? Where are we putting our treasures? Are we storing them here? Because my Bible says that they'll be eaten by moths and rust away. But when we store our treasures in heaven, those are the ones that are safe for us for eternity. What's the writing on your wall saying? Verse 30, that very night, that very night, not the next night, not sometime down there. Remember, King Nebuchadnezzar was seven, or it was a year later, I mean, before he went insane for seven years. He was given a year to straighten out. That very night, Belshazzar, king of the Babylonians, was slain, and Darius the Mede took over the kingdom at the age of 62. I haven't figured out why they tell us how old he was, other than that this old guy could slaughter the young guy, other than that. Interesting little side note, you know how, how they got into the castle, how, how they got into the palace, how they slaughtered him, how they took over Babylonia? They blocked off the river so they could walk, they walked in the riverbed, and they snuck in. And they slaughtered him, and they were so drunk that they had probably had no clue they were even being slaughtered. They couldn't have defended themselves if they wanted to. Remember, the scripture tells us to, to, to we never know. The thief will come in tonight. We don't know when. 
always be prepared. Do not be in a drunken way. Remember all those things? They were doing them all. They were totally unprepared. They were not paying attention if the thief was coming and they were drunk out of their minds. So Darius the Mede walks in. Not a single soldier of the Mede army was, was injured. Took him over. That very night, God ended Belshazzar's mockery of him. That very night, he said, enough's enough. You've been warned. You've been warned for two generations. You've been what you knew. And you chose to mock me. You chose to say I was not your God. And today is the day that I say enough's enough. What's the writing on your wall? What's he telling you? Are you afraid of it? Here's something I want to share with you. Because right now you're going, dude, you just brought me down. Them kids had me smiling. I was in good shape, right? Pastor, you just brought me way, way down, right? You just wrecked my day. Now I'm going to go out and be bummed all day. You don't have to be. Because here's the good news. Here's the good news. I want to share something with you. There's this, this little scripture that's out there, this little thing. It's called John 3.16, and it's followed by John 3.17. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have what? Eternal life. We all know that, right? And he goes on to say in 17, For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Look, here's the thing. He's already done the work. All we have to do is give up our life. All we have to do is give up our, we can do it right now. Here, that's the beauty of it. Man, a living, we can either be Belshazzar, we can stay where we're at, or we can be Nebuchadnezzar and say, no, wait a minute, I've seen the light. God is God, the God, the God of Daniel, the God of Judah, the God of Israel. That's the God. He's the one I'm worshiping. He's the one I'm following. He's the one you need to worship. He's the one. We could choose to do that, and if we'll choose to do that, and we choose to understand and acknowledge and and embrace the fact and die to self and be born again in Jesus, that Jesus Christ went to that cross, he came to this earth, he walked this earth to set the examples for us, to show us exactly how to live. It's all right in here. He came and he did, and he died, and he was he was brutalized and he was slaughtered for you and for me, and he rose again from that grave, which is the most important part of that, that he rose again from that grave. He defeated death. He defeated Satan. He defeated evil. He defeated that. He defeated all wickedness. And today, when we choose to say, Lord, I'm dying to self. Today, Lord, I live for Jesus Christ. Today, I live in Jesus Christ. I no longer am going to live according to this world. I no longer am going to be Belshazzar. Today, I'm Nebuchadnezzar on his redemption day. Dear Lord, today, I'm yours. We don't have to go to hell. We don't have to die today in evil. We don't have to die in wickedness. We don't have to die in that. Today, we can. if we die today, it doesn't matter if we make that decision right now that from now on, from now on, Jesus Christ is my Lord. He will rule my calendar. Today, from now on, I will do what God calls me to do. From now on, I will not live according to this world. From now on, I will not live according to what Satan wants me to live. From now on, I will evict him from my heart. From now on, I am a child of the king. I am a child of the king. Today, we can choose that. It don't have to be a bad day. It's a beautiful day. It's a blessed day. It's a wonderful. He gave us a breath, did he not? He gave us a pulse, did he not? He gave us opportunities, did he not? Today, one of those opportunities is give it up for Jesus Christ. Today we can do that. Today. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Amen. Thank you, Father. Today is the day. Please join me before the Lord. Dear Lord, dear Lord, thank you for today. Thank you that Belshazzar set the example we don't want to follow, but yet we can learn from it. Thank you, Lord. Thank you that Nebuchadnezzar refused to follow you for so many years, and then, Lord, he did. He came to you, Lord. 
Thank you, Lord, that we can learn from that. Thank you, Lord, that over and over throughout history, we have, we have over and over story after story, Father God, of, of people who chose not to follow you, and we have stories we understand. We know your word that tells us over and over again how others have come to you, dear Lord. And, Father God, we've seen it in our own lives. We know people who, man, they're suddenly, it's like they're not the same person. Father God, thank you. Thank you that your son chose. He said he didn't say, no, Dad, I don't really, you know, I really don't like him that much. Instead, he said, Father God, I, I love him so much. I love him as much as you do. And yes, Dad, I will go down there and I will do that. I will lower myself. I'll be a servant to them. I'll wash their feet and I will die for them. And I'll teach them everything they need to know. Father God, thank you that we have a Savior that loves us so very much. We have a Savior that loves us so very much, he gave up everything. He gave up the right hand of the throne. He gave up the right hand of the throne, which is exactly what Belshazzar would not give up. He gave up the right hand of the throne, the throne, your throne. He gave up the right hand seat to come and do what a right hand man would do, what a right hand person would do. Father God, thank you that he chose. He said, I love him just as much as you, Dad. I want to go and do this. Yeah, it's going to suck some. Yeah, it's going to hurt a lot. Lord, I thank you that you were willing to come and do that, that you were willing to come and hang on that old rugged cross. Thank you for loving us so much. You chose to defeat the grave. You chose to defeat Satan. You chose that, Lord, that we, we can just choose you and follow you and receive the blessing that you have for us, the blessing not only of a, a godly life now, but eternity with you. Father God, I thank you so very much. And Father God, I just ask right now, there are those who are here who are like, man, yeah, the writing's on the wall. It's been there. It's been there, and, I, and I've been ignoring it. I've been blowing it off. I haven't, I haven't, I haven't, I, I haven't even asked anyone to help me interpret it. I don't, know, I don't know what it says. It's all Greek to me. I have no clue what it says. There are those who are here who are like, man, I need to know. And I want to do whatever it is God's asking me to do. And, I, and I've been worshiping my little G's. But today I want to follow my God, the God, the God of Daniel, the God of Israel, the God of the universe, the God, the one and only, the God, my creator, the God, my savior, the God that loves me and knew me even before I was knit in my mother's womb that God today I want to start serving him today I'm going to die to self and I'm going to be born again in him I want life in Jesus instead of just asking Jesus into my life I want to be living in Jesus I want to go beyond claiming the name I'm really good at claiming the name but man I want to go beyond that Father God, there are those who are sitting here today, those who are online who are saying right now, I need that. I need to do that today. I'm going to do that today. I declare my life for Jesus Christ. Father, I ask, as, as they're right now, they're asking you to do that, and they're like, well, I don't know what to say. Well, just say, Lord, I, I suck. I, I'm really a big, huge sinner. And, and I've failed and I've failed and I've failed and I've rejected and I was prideful and I did all these things. I did whatever it is and it fill in the blank in your heart. And just say, Father God, just please, please accept me dying to self and being born in you. Please give me the strength, the courage, the heart to follow Jesus Christ and do what he's asking of me to do. And if you'll just do that today, just do that today, Jesus will say, welcome home, welcome home.
Father God, I ask that as each one has shared their heart, they're willing, willing and wanting and are handing over their life to you, I just ask, Lord, that you just bless them in amazing ways. I ask you to, to bring alongside of them those who can help them stand up and walk in the new light that they're in. Father God, that, that, that they, would, they would embrace their new life. That, Father God, from today on, they worship you and you alone. I just pray all these things in your loving Son, Jesus Christ's name. Amen. I know you've you've heard me say this before, and, and I know that there are those I've had people say to me that you're worried about numbers, and I am. I'm worried about every number that is not in the book of the Lord, in the book of God, uh, in the book of life. I'm worried about every number, every person, every heart, every soul, every spirit that is not living for Jesus Christ. Yes, I am worried about that number. That number matters to me. I'm not worried about the number of salvations, the number of uh, recommitments. I'm not worried about that. What I'm worried about, though, is the fact that you have someone to walk alongside of you because otherwise, and especially those who have had to recommit their lives, who chose today to recommit their lives to the Lord, done it before, but, man, I'm just doing really bad at it. The reason you failed is because you weren't walking with people who were willing to walk with you and lift you up and encourage you and help you to grow. And it's really easy for Satan to pull us down when we're on our own. It's really easy for him to knock us off when we're on our own. Because the problem is, is I don't want anyone to see me fill out that card. I don't want anyone to see me or hear me tell pastor that today I gave my life to Christ. Would you walk with me? I, I don't want to. Do we hear what's in the middle of that, where we're in the middle of? We're in the middle of sin. We're in the middle of pride. So don't let your eyes deceive you today. If you've given your life to Christ, if you've recommitted your life to Christ, please let us know. The response cards are out by the prayer box. Um, and, and so please let us know. Fill it out. Put it in there. And also I've had someone ask me about baptism. Um, and so we're going to have a baptism coming up. If God's been working on you in that, please mark that on the card also so we know. And I want to talk with you about that. Let's walk through that, okay? And so um, just please don't, don't let your eye get in the way of what God has for you today. God bless. I love you.